Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us for this roundtable that's putting a spotlight on the 30 year anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody and a spotlight on the New South Wales report into First Nations Deaths in Custody. Uh, this event's hosted by the National Justice Project, the ALS New South Wales ACT, Deadly Connections and the Jumbana Institute. I'm Larissa Barrett and I have the privilege of hosting tonight's forum. Uh, as you can see, we have some amazing panellists who bring extensive experience and great insights into what we'll be talking about tonight, but I don't want to go any further without introducing Auntie Glendra Stubbs, who's going to uh, do our acknowledgement of country. Auntie Glendra is a Wiradjuri woman. She's the elder in residence at UTS, where I don't know what we'd do without her. She's got 40 years of experience providing advice and practical assistance to survivors of trauma and has long experience in supporting families and working through issues arising from out of home care. Um, particularly, she's been an important person in um, relation to link up and helping people get back in touch with their families. Um, she's done a, a, an amazing amount of work in public life. Um, she's worked on a number of state and national bodies, um, including being um, an Aboriginal engagement advisor to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Assault, the National Stolen Generations Alliance, the Metro Migrant Resource Centre. Um, so, Arnie Glendra, um, thank you so much, and I'll hand over to you for the acknowledgement of country. Well, I'm tired hearing that, Larissa. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Larissa. Always lovely to, to see you. Um, and it's an honour to be part of such an amazing panel. So, Yalamandu Marang Galindara, welcome to Like Minded People. Thanks, Tim, for asking me. Thanks to UTS for, for believing in all the things that I, um, I've, I'm passionate about, child protection, social justice, law and reform. So thanks um, again. So firstly and um, importantly, I'd like to pay respects to elders of the Gadigal Nation and the Eora Nation, of the Eora Nation, oh gosh, sorry. Um, and all the people of the nations that we are connecting from today, tonight and say thanks for allowing us here. Honour to the elders here today and pay thanks for the elders of the past who have shared their knowledge, teaching, learning practices with us. Also to our young pe people, we pay respects to the Aboriginal custodianship of country. We, we need to acknowledge the struggles we as Aboriginal people have day to day to make our fam keep our families together and to be as strong as we can be. With lo with, and with all the um, institutionalised um, ness of out of home care and the custodial sentence. While at Link Up, I first became aware of, um, of Black Deaths in Custody when uh, a lady um, in 1985, her husband was a death in custody, Letty Scott. She arrived at the Link Up office in a, in a panel van, or what do you call it? A, you know, station wagon with her supporter and one of her children and the images that she showed me of her husband haunt me to this day she was an amazing woman who um so her husband was arrested for bad language and remanded for 60 days in 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 custody four days later he was not with with us anymore so she, um, ballsy as she was, I hope that was all right to say, she um, lobbed up to Paul Keating. She took it to the United Nations. She never, never st stopped fighting for justice. But that fight for justice took a toll on her life. Letty didn't make old bones. She left children with no mother and no father, but fought till the last breath in her body. Fighting for justice, for everyone that's in the same situation as her. So um, I just wanted to say that profoundly affected me. Um, another thing I'd like to acknowledge is my time, like Larissa said, at No More. And my role there was, one of my roles was talking to prisoners. And it became very clear to me, the pathway from out of home care to juvenile justice 
to the big house. I mean, there's so many of our men and women inside that families must be worried every day. Are they going to be here tomorrow? So, um, so I want to thank all those social justice lawyers, those warriors that are, that are there every day trying to make a difference with redress and justice for our mob. Keep up the good fight, guys. And to our non-Indigenous non brothers and sisters, you know, when I think back and look at, my, you know, saying sorry and walking across the bridge, we had 250,000 people that held our hands and walked with us together. Let's do that again. Let's have our sorry for our deaths in custody. So um, thank you, Larissa. And I've just got a, a reflection that I hope I can read. <laughs> so um, it's okay if I look at it when I read it, because I've written it down. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm, part, I'm moving on from the acknowledgement and I'm moving on to my reflections. Um, before I reflect on the broader issues around Aboriginal deaths in custody, I would like to pay tribute to, to the people whose stories influence the New South Wales report. You have taken a step that can find justice for your loved ones, to stop deaths in custody and to protect our communities. The report itself, itself acknowledges the importance of your contribution and your courage and resilience in coming forward. It also acknowledges the immense difficulty in speaking so honestly and op openly about your heartbreaking broken, breaking losses. Your experience provide a tragic link between the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody and the New South Wales report. Both reports deal with how to reduce the over-representation of Aboriginal people in custody and how to safeguard them when they are in custody. Unfortunately, many of the Royal Commission's recommendations have not been implemented today, now 30 years later, and the rate of over-representation has doubled. Even more unfortunately, the failure to reduce over-representation is part of a general pattern of failures. Since the Royal Commission, there have been all kinds of inquiries about inquires affecting our people. Between them, these reports cover child protection, out-of-home care, juvenile det detention and adult incarceration. Despite these reports, over-representation in these areas has, has worsened. These failures mean that little has been done to break the unnecessary pattern of removal from family early in life to incarceration later in, on. Self-determination is critical if governments want to change pattern, this pattern. Like all Australians, we want to be able to determine our own futures. But who are we and what we want is still decided for us by people who do not walk in our shoes. With the best will in the world, these people cannot know from lived experience how our nations work or how our culture is embedded in every aspect of that. We as First Nation people know the protocols around decision makings in our nations. We know that we cannot speak for another nation, yet other people are making decisions about us without the expert knowledge that is needed. I will highlight just two areas where this matter. The first is the diversity of Australia's First Nations. We are many nations with many cultures. A one-size-fits-all approach to policies, programs and practices is therefore doomed to failure. We know that and within our nations that we can make decisions that are needed. And we have done this for thousands of years. The second area is our sense of community. Our family relationships are generally more extensive than the settler society. We have a very strong sense of how the lives of individuals and individuals and families are intertwined with the lives of and the future of the community. This means with the loss of individuals from families also does extraordinary damage to communities. To make it worse, this, this is happening to communities which are already carrying a tremendous burden of intergenerational loss, grief and sorry, sorrow and sorry. 
We can change this if governments listen to us and act on what we say. We can argue that this is our right as Indigenous people, but we can also argue that it is essential for success. This is because we are the only people who have the expertise on the central issues that create success. We are the experts on our diverse nations and our cultures. We are the experts on the ways settler systems have affected and continue to affect our nation and cultures. We are the experts on the change today. Governments need to make sure self-determination of First Nations people. We are also the experts on how our First Nations can adapt to settler systems without sacrificing the integrity of our own nations and cultures. But we are not just experts on systems. We are we are also have the on the ground knowledge of our communities and how they work. That means we have the expertise in design, implement and evaluation what is needed for our families, our communities in all their diversity to thrive. Over the last year, governments have stressed that to deal with COVID-19 emergency, we are now paying politics. We are not playing politics, but taking the advice of the medical experts we ask them in these emergencies in the First Nations life to take our advice in the areas that we are the experts. This did not happen following the Royal Commission, but I do hope for the future. One encouraging sign is the recent New South Wales report. There are many positive things in that report. However, even though it stresses the critical role of self-determination, it did not make a specific recommendation on this central issue. I am looking forward to hearing what our speakers and others have to say about the New South Wales report. And I'm sure we will, we will all wonder whether it, like many of our other reports, will end up just words on paper rather than driving action. I'm also looking forward to hearing what you have to say about how we can continue to work together to get the action that is badly needed and well overdue to prevent more Aboriginal deaths in custody and the damage it does to each of us, to our families and to our communities and our nations. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Aini Glendra. And I know that everyone listening will have been really touched by your words and your insights. Um, we're so lucky to have the privilege of hearing your wisdom. Um, and in particular, when I was listening to you talk, I was reminded by a conversation that I had um, earlier today uh, with Latoya Rule, who I think I saw um, make a comment about which land she's on. But uh, it was a reminder to me of how many of our advocates, how many we've got, how tireless they are, the, the, the knowledge they hold and how a primary driver for people working in this area, which is really difficult, is, is often just to make sure what's happened to them doesn't happen to other people. There's a, there's a, a real um, generosity of spirit in doing this work and, and you embody that as well, Auntie Glendra. So thank you so much for, for that. Um, so I am on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So I just join in paying my respects uh, to them and to the elders across the country. It's lovely to see everyone sharing what country they're on in the chat box. Um, so tonight we're bringing together some very important voices. And I just want to acknowledge that we're doing that after what was a very emotional week for uh, the members of our panel who work so deeply on these issues. It was a big week with both the um, Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody having its anniversary and everything that was around that. And then of course, the, um, the emotional roller coaster of the New South Wales Parliamentary Report are coming down. So I just also wanted to um, acknowledge uh, the work that Carly Keenan, Keenan and Alison and Paul, who's yet to join us, but hopefully will, uh, did during the week and uh, that it, it is also um, an act of real generosity of them to, amongst all of that, take the time to share their reflections with us tonight. Um, I'm going to start with Carly, um, uh, who, um, you know, has, has just been um, absolutely uh, staunch and inspiring in this, this space. Um, 
So I'm very privileged to uh, introduce someone who I admire so much. Carly Warner is a Tasmanian Aboriginal woman and a lawyer who grew up in regional northeast Victoria on Yorta Yorta and Dudarua country. Carly joined the Aboriginal Legal Service New South Wales ACT after a number of years leading NATSALS where she's advocated tirelessly and continuously for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities across the country. She was before then a practicing lawyer at the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service or VALS um, with experience working across criminal, civil, child protection and family law. Um, but I've also always admired her tireless energy, um, which uh, she's showing tonight by continuing after what's been quite a week for her. So Carly, I wanted to just ask by, I guess, starting with a question about you know, how it felt for you, given the work that you've been doing across such a long period of time in the space you've been doing it, that um, from a sort of personal point of view, what did the 30 year anniversary of the Royal Commission mean to you? Yeah, thanks, Larissa. And I just want to thank Annie Glendra for your powerful words and continuous advocacy. Um, thank you for all that you do and acknowledge country. I join you from um, Wongal, Gadigal and, and your land um, today. I was um, looking at some of the photos at the ALS 50th anniversary exhibition last Friday and um, sort of paused and reflected on there's a photo that's taken at the New South Wales protest in solidarity um, following the death of John Pat, who died in 1983 um, at the young age of 16. And it's it just um, sort of struck by, it's almost like a, a feeling of, of failure, really, that we have failed the families who have lost loved ones um, to deaths in custody. I just think this is an absolute moment of shame for this country that we have had solutions to save lives for almost 30 years um, and refused to turn them into action. Um, but, of course, in that, and we absolutely have to recognise that failure and that we have failed those families, um, but also a moment of opportunity and a moment of thanks to the families in particular um, for their continuous advocacy, often um, throughout grief. Um, but Aboriginal people are, are keenly aware of deaths in custody and just think this is a chance to amplify the issues across all communities and culture and cultures. Um, together with NATSALs and, and other ATSALs across the country, Really, we really aim to centre the voices of families who have lost their loved ones. And, of course, um, you can have a look on the NATSALS website, but there are 15 Aboriginal families whose loved ones have died in custody and they've issued a list of 10 demands for change. Um, you know, the best time for action being 30 years ago, but the next best time is, is right now. Um, and so we have to listen to the families and prevent more senseless deaths from occurring. And I really hope, um, following their request, to meet with the Prime Minister in June, um, that he actually honours that. It would be um, incredibly shameful if their request was ignored or denied. Mm, thank you. Um, the, obviously, as I mentioned, one of the, um, the big moments of last week was the handing down of the New South Wales Parliamentary Inquiry into First Nations deaths in custody. Obviously, it was a moment that uh, highlighted how far we had yet to go in relation to the implementation of the Royal Commission. Um, but from your perspective, considering how deeply you had looked at that and understand the issues, what do you think were some of the, um, the key findings of the inquiry? Um, look, I, I think the, the first one that obviously slaps you in the face is that the inquiry found that 30 years on from rickety we're no closer to ending the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in the legal system. Um, and it is absolutely warranted that the very first recommendation is about implementing rickety recommendations. Um, it, it obviously found that, you know, the multi-generational disadvantage underscores Aboriginal people's experiences with the legal system. But I have to say, I don't think it went far enough in 
critiquing government responsibility um, in entrenching that disadvantage, nor the systemic racism and the direct role it plays with police and corrective services and other institutions leading to our forced contact with the justice system and ultimately to First Nations deaths in custody. Um, young people were, were absolutely a focus and rightly so. The inquiry said that, you know, they're the key to breaking the cycle. Um, one of the key recommendations in terms of young people is to raise the age of legal responsibility to at least 14. Um, we support this. I also would have liked to have seen um, the recommendation expanded um, and, and go a little bit further in relation to the suspect target management scheme. I think this just should be abolished, um, you know, generally, but immediately for all children. Um, and also I think one of the other, um, of course, critical findings, and I don't think there would be anyone who disagrees with this, that um, the inquiry found it a better approach to oversighting deaths in custody is critical. The current system is plagued by doubts um, about independence and transparency, and we wholeheartedly agree. Mm. Um, were there things within the report that you um, thought uh, were were useful that were, I guess, uh, I'd be interested to hear what you thought were any positives as well as what were, I and mean, you've already touched on some of the things that you thought could have gone further, but were there other things that you were a bit disappointed by in relation to the, the report? I thought actually there are a number of really good recommendations that, um, that we welcome. As I say, the focus on implementing Rickettick recommendations is a no-brainer. Um, the recommendations to raise the age of legal responsibility to at least 14, again, um, a no-brainer. The recommendation to amend the Bail Act to include a provision requiring decision makers to take into account a person's Aboriginality um, and this would be similar to the Victorian provision, Section 3A of the Bail Act there, just to make sure decision makers actually focus on that. And, of course, there needs to be um, training and education about what that even means because it's one thing to have a provision within legislation. It's another thing to make sure that you've actually got practitioners who know how to make submissions on it. Um, the expansion of circle sentencing, expansion of the drug court, um, funding the Wollamer Court, um, providing adequate funding and resources to ensure that, that there's drug and alcohol rehabilitation services across New South Wales, um, and recommendations to, you know, expand the powers and resources of the coroner's court. There's a number of really good things in there. Um, we think, you know, there's some others probably that are moving in the right direction. Um, expanded powers and resources for LAC to investigate deaths in custody across both police and corrective services. But, I mean, this is only going to work if Aboriginal people are represented at the highest levels of the decision-making. Um, there has to be an Aboriginal identified commissioner role at LEC at the very least. Um, and, of course, you know, there's, there were lots of calls to actually have a standalone First Nations-led body to do this investigating. So, again, things that could have gone further. Um, I think amending Section 4A of the Summary Offences Act could definitely have gone further. This should be repealed entirely. It is shameful that anyone is still landing behind bars for so-called offensive language. It is just archaic. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the commentary in there about, you know, intimidation and others, there's already provision in the Crimes Act for that. Just get rid of it. Um, despite sort of the, the references both throughout the report and at the press conference, um, given by the number of the select committee members um, just after the release of the report, and this was to the significance of the Black Lives Matter movement, I thought there was really limited critique of systemic racism throughout the report. There are nine mentions of racism in the 250-page report, no mention of it in the recommendations. Um, there's a recommendation that the New South Wales government amend the Coroner's Act to stipulate that the coroner is required to examine whether there are systemic issues in relation to a death in custody, um, of course, in particular for First Nations people. And this is really good, but, 
you can't achieve justice for Aboriginal people and expect submissions and representations to be made um, by culturally safe um, justice bodies about these systemic issues that are impacting First Nations people without actually adequately resourcing the organisations that represent them within the justice system. Um, there is on that, there is no critique of the ALS's limited funding, no recommendations to provide adequate resources for culturally safe legal representation, um, the support to families throughout kind of coronial inquests. We've got nine coronial inquests into deaths in custody on at the moment, and I thought this was a missed opportunity. Um, I was a bit disappointed that there's a six month period for New South Wales government to respond. I just think we have had five deaths in custody in the last two months. You know, how many are gonna die in those six months? And that's just a response. Um, and I, I think lastly, in terms of um, disappointments, and I'm glad you asked me to start with the positive things first, Larissa. <laughs> um, I do query why there's a recommendation to establish a select committee to conduct an inquiry into the New South Wales coronial system. Um, and I, I'm not suggesting that, you know, this is full and comprehensive and there's no need, but just how many inquiries do we need? I thought this inquiry was actually going to look at the oversight mechanisms um, for that. So uh, waiting, I guess, for another um, inquiry that we'll respond to. I guess one of the questions that comes up too is that, um, you know, obviously um, we, we look back at 30 years of the Royal Commission and the recommendations not being implemented. Given that this was a parliamentary inquiry that had representation across the parliament, do you, do you feel confident that the recommendations might be picked up? I think that is certainly what we're hoping for. Um, I mean, I, I must admit I'm yet to go through the entire report with a fine tooth comb to see if there's any dissent that's listed in relation to the select committee members. But I mean, we had four of them standing together um, talking about this report. And so my hope is that what they have done in terms of the, the recommendations is recommend things that are achievable at the very least. And so my expectation is that the New South Wales government has no excuse whatsoever um, not to support both um, this government um, implementing those, but a bipartisan approach or a multi-partisan approach to actually implementing these recommendations at the very least. I just want to pick up on something. Um, I was interested to ask you a, a question about the role of the ALSs, and I noticed you made the comment about there not being enough analysis within the report about the, the funding issues that are facing our community controlled organisations that are at the coalface. So I was wondering if just uh, we could get your thoughts on what you see as the role of the Aboriginal community controlled sector, particularly our Aboriginal legal service, services, in addressing issues of over representation in the criminal justice system and around deaths in custody? I think our role um, is absolutely crucial. And one of the key points that we made to the inquiry was um, this inquiry, if all it does is come back with recommendations about how to include more Aboriginal people in the systems that are ultimately failing us, this inquiry will fail. Um, Aboriginal people have very good reasons to distrust the legal system um, without a culturally safe community controlled response, without our community controlled orgs, then there is no opportunity to kind of be pushing some of the systemic issues to be talking about um, the systemic racism that actually is leading to deaths in custody, that is leading to our over-representation. Um, I was disappointed that there probably wasn't more commentary about that and the, and the role of community control organisations. Again, um, it's great, you know, that, there's, that there is often a focus on um, Aboriginal employment strategies within government and within bureaucracies. But for all of us in community controlled organisations, we know how hard it is to keep mob actually in the community controlled sector 
they can go and get more resources um, within government organisations. And really, that's not a choice for community. Like there is no real choice as to who you want to work for in the end when, you know, your life sort of changes, you're thinking about perhaps rent, mortgages, all of those things. Ultimately, there's no choice. And unless they're going to invest into community controlled organisations, um, we're not going to see kind of any change in the system. Um, I was also wondering then sort of back to the 30 year anniversary of the Royal Commission. Obviously, there are a lot of recommendations there and a lot of recommendations that are you've, you've um, uh, discussed in relation to the New South Wales parliamentary report. In terms of where you see priority areas going forward, what would you identify those as being? And it kind of picks up on a question the audience members put through earlier that Molly asked about what are the legal reforms that you think would be most effective in terms of improving the safety and security of, of Indigenous Australians, of First Nations people? Um, look, immediate, independent and transparent investigations of deaths in custody has to be first and foremost. You know, no police investigating police, no waiting periods of two plus years for families um, to get answers from the coronial process, um, an immediate reduction of Aboriginal over-representation in the legal system and an investment in decarceration strategies. Um, as I said before, you know, it would just... Absolutely, there's not even any legislation that surrounds the suspect target management um, program. So it could just be immediately with a policy decision be gotten rid of. Um, clear, formal and effective oversight mechanisms for government to respond to the coronial recommendations and of course, to other recommendations that have been made. And I just think um, one of the things that I, I'm sure um, others will further reflect on, but um, the importance sort of throughout this recent inquiry of centering, centering the family voices um, within that inquiry and making sure that those family voices um, are centred in terms of any policy responses as a result. Um, what I have to say in terms of any, um, when, when, when there's a question sort of asked about um, legal reform, if you like, legal reform will only have an impact if the systemic racism that underpins the institutions that make up our justice system is actually addressed. You know, I could say it's absolutely a priority um, that we review the Bail Act, and it is within New South Wales. But when you have Boxar releasing reports that say, you know, all other observable characteristics being equal, police um, are more likely to refuse bail to adults and juveniles if they're Aboriginal by 20 and 12% respectively. Reviewing the Bail Act, you know, is only half of it. We, we have to make sure that that systemic racism is addressed alongside any strict legal reforms to the system. The, um, just picking up on that, obviously you talk importantly about recognising the inherent systemic racism. Another question that came through from Patrick was uh, a question about how we're going to address uh, issues of incarceration rates when they're interconnected with other issues, such as intergenerational tra trauma, um, housing, domestic violence. So I guess just finally, um, I wondered if you'd like to reflect on that bigger picture of the other things that um, need to happen in terms of complementing reform to the legal system, particularly quite specific legal reforms as we've discussed. Yeah, and, and thanks. So it's almost um, sort of a good way to end and it's where I think I started, but that was one of the things about the report, I think, that didn't go far enough in talking about government's responsibility and entrenching that disadvantage, um, you know, since colonisation, um, essentially, and, and that oppression. But, you know, there's so many things, public housing, making sure there's a strong um, social net so people are not falling into poverty um, when they're needing it most absolutely addressing the systemic racism that is embedded in the design 
of our systems and our institutions. Um, you got to turn them on the head. And I just think if we're not sort of focusing on all of those, those things, and, you know, some people will probably say, well, that sounds like a, a fair bit. Why don't we just take sort of bite-sized chunks out of the elephant and just focus on some of the smaller things? Um, and whoever said that, that, that change and movements were mutually exclusive, look, we can absolutely do more than one thing at a time, um, at a time we start doing it. Carly, thank you so much. It's so great to hear your insights and your experience and just to shed a light on, on things to help us really dig down into them. I always really appreciate hearing what you've got to say on anything and I particularly appreciate it after everything you've been through in the last week or so um, to take the time to do that with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Alison Whittaker, a Gomorrah woman, poet, legal scholar from Gunnada and Tamworth in Northwest New South Wales. She is a passionate and courageous storyteller who works primarily in media law and women's uh, law and policy. Uh, actually, I'm just reading that and thinking that's a very narrow description of where Alison works. She works quite across a range of issues in the um, criminal justice system and the policy area as well. And I know this because she's a senior research fellow at the Jambana Institute um, and she's recently joined the advisory board of the National Justice Project. Um, I particularly appreciate um, Alison's wisdom and patience and uh, I feel like I learn a lot from her just this week. I think she taught me a little bit more about patience, but that's the story for another day. Alison, it's so nice to see you here tonight. I know you've had quite a big week as well. So I thought I would ask you as well as I started with Carly, just from a very personal point of view, working so much in the area, what were your reflections anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody? Yeah, um, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from uh, Gadigal and Mongol country, um, over which sovereignty was never ceded. And I also want to take the chance to acknowledge uh, Gadigal and Mongol elders and ancestors um, who continue to, to govern this place today. I, I don't know about anybody else on the panel, but I experienced um, a profound tiredness on, on April 15. Um, I wasn't around, um, I wasn't alive when this report was handed down along with its 339 recommendations, um, but it's become um, effectively a, a stake in the ground from which we measure um, the, the pain and agony of our communities um, as they're subjected to, to state violence through police and prisons. Um, and that heaviness continued through the day. Um, I think the seeing the enormity um, through especially the, the Guardian's reporting that 474 deaths had actually occurred since 1991, a revised number that was significantly higher than what we were protesting last year. Um, and also with the knowledge that for every one of those 474, there was a family who was left behind and left with this enormous um, chasm in their lives that they now had to navigate around. Um, and that was only exacerbated by the review systems that followed. So there's a sense of frustration to, to see also as we're looking back over those 30 years, report after report um, and inquest after inquest that's more or less recommending the same thing. Um, and especially frustrating to see the, the issue painted in um, mainstream media as something that's an information deficit that we need to, to know more or to research more. Um, and as much as I, as a researcher, think that research is the answer to most things, we actually know enough. We knew enough 30 years ago. Um, we probably knew enough long before then about the continuum of violence that starts when a First Nations person enters custody and for some reaches the severity of a death in custody. We know that the answer to that is to stop mob from going into prison in the first place, to stop contact with police. And it's infuriating to watch the very opposite thing happen year after year um, as these tiny little reports um, tinker around the edges of that problem, that really fundamental problem. Um, so I was going to ask you what your reactions to the New South Wales Parliamentary Republic 
report were, um, I think we've got a sense of the emotion, but I wondered if you wanted to add some of your reflections to uh, that as well. Mm. Yeah, um, I was uh, quite disappointed, I think, with, um, I'll speak to the um, review systems that meet families after their loved one has died. Um, those recommendations kind of came at the, the end of the report and um, they very much concerned me. Uh, one of the key discussions that was raised during the hearings um, that occurred um, in front of the select committee um, was this tension between two models, if there was going to be um, what's called like a light resourcing model, um, where we um, shoehorn First Nations peoples um, and certain investigative principles into existing institutions, um, or if we do the resource and the work heavy model, um, which requires us to fundamentally rethink review systems, um, where actually like First Nations communities uh, lead the investigation, set its terms and have a very expansive view on what more want to know after someone has died inside. And I think um, quite reprehensibly, um, the select committee made the recommendation instead that the Law Enforcement Conduct Commission um, be tasked with doing investigations into deaths in custody. And I want to echo what Carly said earlier um, in the sense that unless there is any significant community control over this process, there's going to be an absolutely justifiably no faith in it. Um, because we have learnt, um, I guess, from a long series of uh, reviews into review systems, um, that the answer to this independence problem 30 years ago was posed as coroners, and now to pose it as the LECC is going to reveal the same problems that we've had again and again and again. And to see also in an ensuing recommendation um, that followed the, the recommendation of the LECC investigate deaths in custody, that the extent of First Nations control was just going to be uh, a senior position within the organisation that would be tasked with uh, community engagement and internal engagement, um, as if the problem was um, that communities were insufficiently engaged uh, with the LECC in the first place, um, and as if the problem is one of um, cultural competency instead of state violence. So those things trouble me um, about the recommendations. Um, I support um, any of the recommendations that, um, as Carly said, um, are kind of focused on keeping mob out of prison um, or extending the reach of bail. Um, I support those um, because um, I'm a, I, I support them to the extent that they um, support abolitionist demands that get us away from the use of prisons. And so if they are um, in any systematic way contributing to the decarceration of our mob, I'm fully behind them. But I agree with Carly that a lot of them don't go far enough um, in the decriminalization of offenses that we know um, police use to scoop up mob in public um, and expand their reach. We know that tinkering around the edges of the definitions of those offenses isn't actually gonna change the problem. Um, it's the fact that there are these public order offenses in the first place that enable a huge swathe of police discretion to take our people off the street. I was going to ask you next, more particularly what you thought it needed to be um, reformed about the coronial inquest process. I think you've touched on that a little bit. And actually, one of the questions from Cheryl, I think, asked the question even better than I was going to put it, which was, what can be done to ensure absolute independent investigations of all deaths in custody for First Nations people? Mm. So what needs to happen, um, I'll, I'll take you through the current process in order to understand what needs to happen with the next process. Um, so every death in custody since more or less the Royal Commission um, has an independent um, inquest. So every death in custody is subject to a, a kind of investigation that the Royal Commission uh, recommended be conducted as if every death in custody was a, a homicide until proven afterwards. And after that, um, uh, usually a specialist police um, unit will prepare a brief uh, for the coroner, which is then um, handed to the council assisting. Families don't often have access to that brief, which includes a, a root cause analysis of um, 
the, the death of their loved one. And then this inquest happens, um, as Carly mentioned earlier, usually with a huge latency period of two to three years in which families are left in the lurch um, unless they have really proactive legal representation. And in that process of the inquest, um, a coroner is tasked with making recommendations, uh, which in New South Wales are not binding um, on any party. Um, and there's actually no obligation to respond to them except through a premier's memorandum. Um, and the coroner will also make decisions about the, the cause and the manner of death. Um, and they can also, um, and have done in very few instances um, in New South Wales, but in one very critical one quite recently, make referrals to uh, prosecutors uh, to, to review the file and see if there is any, um, any criminal offence uh, committed in connection with the death. Um, families find uh, a lot of this process in New South Wales hugely alienating. Um, in part because there's no uh, clear sense of what the family's role is in an inquest. So there's this huge push that you kind of see alongside the Royal Commission to have families involved, to have communities involved at inquests, almost um, entirely as a, a kind of a transparency role or as a memorial role. Um, and obviously that, that's, not, that's not sufficient. Families have contributions, families have skepticism, families have a critical role in the review process that is not currently respected. Um, and aside from um, the, the need for independent First Nations led community controlled investigations, which I think has been the case has been well made by Carly why we need those. The centrality of families in the review process that follows in my mind is most critical because there's all of these interests represented at inquests, numerous parties, it looks almost like no other, um, I guess, legal matter that many of us would be familiar with. And all among these state parties, there's just one person representing the next of kin's interest. And they're incredibly outgunned. Other um, state parties commonly appear before the inquest. Families often only appear once to defend the, the dignity of their loved one. Um, and it's just almost insurmountable. So there needs to be a fundamental change to how inquests are run um, to give families standing on critical issues. Thank you. Um, I want to pick up on something else you said uh, earlier and draw that out a bit. Um, it's your, um, your uh, observation about the, the fact that we need to move away from incarceration as a model. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about that. I think people are really interested in what that might look like and what that might mean. And uh, also uh, not unrelated to that, what, what you um, understand when you use the term defund the police or hear that to mean as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm probably not um, a, a great person to be talking authoritatively on this. Um, I have no lived experience of um, prison and I encourage people to uh, go and read the extensive literature by people who have and kind of really believe in this abolitionist imaginary. But I think um, something critical about abolition or moving away from incarceration or defunding the police, um, however you want to frame it, is that um, we do abolitionist practices all the time um, in the act of, you know, not calling the police on our neighbours, in the, the act of um, providing uh, basic needs and shelter for one another um, without involving state agencies that have to refer to police. So these are critical things that we do in the day to day instinctively out of care for one another. Um, and one great example of this um, potential, it's not perfect, but in the early days of the pandemic where people were able to see um, the need that one another that we have as a community and really concentrated on building mutual aid networks, um, which to me personally inspired me quite a bit, especially around um, something as important as maintaining COVID restrictions and being able to care for one another even as um, our personal liberties might have been restricted. On one hand, there was this model of policing that saw um, people routinely fined and harassed by police, um, including as the protest movement around Black Lives Matter built in June last year. And on the other side of that, there was this model where people were doing grocery delivery for one another, where people were checking in with one another the reasons that people might be breaching COVID restrictions. And so on a small scale, abolition can look like that. 
But I also want to note um, something that Debbie Kilroy said once, and I, I know you're here attending. I hope um, I'm not misquoting you, so get in the chat if I have. Um, but you said something once about navigating that tension between pushing for an abolitionist future um, and at the same time working for decarceration. So that is that vision that we want in the future that we're trying to bring closer and closer to the present. But there's also making sure that people aren't left behind as we push. And so for me, that the decarceration agenda is really, really critical, getting people out of prison now. And then while we're at it, also making sure that we don't rely on prisons, we're building something in their place. And um, without wanting to sound dramatic, that we're tearing them down. Well, I keep throwing the big questions at you. And I guess my final one for you this evening is also a big picture question. But um, we heard from Carly about the importance of community controlled work and Aboriginal legal services in particular. Um, we also know that a key recommendation of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody was for self-determination to be applied as a policy. Um, and it was also, as Arnie Glendra would tell you, one of the key recommendations in the Bringing Them Home report. Ports often talk about this concept of self-determination. We talk about it as First Nations people. Um, I wonder if we could get your reflections on what it means and why it's so hard for governments to implement it. Hmm. I think the broader tension with um, the recommendation for self-determination, along with the huge political push that has existed for however long whitefellas have been on this continent, that mob control our own affairs in a way that's consistent with our sovereignty. Um, and when governments recommend these things in reports that they implement some kind of self-determination, often what they're talking about is um, community controlled organisations which are absolutely crucial and have formed the backbone, um, I think, of the, the capacity for these inquiries to have that knowledge base in the first place, as well as doing the critical work of keeping our mob safe and alive. On the other hand, um, there's kind of um, a, a contradiction in a government saying that they're going to respect self-determination, where so sovereignty is something that we enact and something that we do. Um, and so governments need to reconceptualize themselves as standing back in this regard. Um, and it's very, very hard often for settler colonial governments to see anything but further, more sophisticated, more tailored intervention as being what's desirable for First Nations people, rather than actually stepping back themselves and seeing what we do um, when we're in control of our own affairs. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Um, I'm going to move on to Keenan now, who's been waiting patiently there. Um, and last but not least, um, truer than this, um, Keenan is the co-founder of Deadly Connections. He's a First Nations man with connections to the Biripai Nation of New South Wales and the Waka Waka Nation in Queensland. Keenan and his wife, Carly Stanley, founded Deadly Connections as a unique community-led solution and to the current mass incarceration and child protection crisis of First Nations. Well, they're committed to changing the narrative of their mob and communities and are really great examples of people using very practical um, ideas and solutions to make real change. There's been already a lot of um, evidence of impact of Keenan's work. So it's a real privilege to have you here tonight, Keenan. Um, and I could see that um, Carly was supporting you in lots of ways, including giving you some more. <laughs> it's great to see what a, what a dynamic duo you two are. So just a bit of an acknowledgement to Carly and her role in this too. But from your experience, obviously very important life experience, what are your reflections on this 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody that was marked last week? Um, I just want to say um, thank you for the deadly intro. Um, thank you all for, for, for the invitation to be among such, um, how do I say it, man? Um, very, very 
uh, advocate, very smart advocating people and, and people that have been in this field way longer than I have. So I'm very, very honoured and humbled to be here. Um, but I think if I can just take 10 seconds, um, I'd like to just have a moment of silence to acknowledge those families that have lost loved ones in custody and just reflect on how hard it would be to continue without any answer or justice. Thank you. So for me, I've been trying to read the recommendations and, and it's been very, very hard because it's very frustrating because from my first glance at it, these new recommendations that have been handed down from this parliamentary inquiry is basically painting Aboriginal people and communities as the problem, which is really difficult for me because you know, you just read out how we sort of came about establishing deadly connections. And, and we, we also, as an Aboriginal community controlled organisation, we live the experience of not just being incarcerated, but having people within my close circle um, lose their life to, to, to an Aboriginal death in custody. That there is no um, true self-determination in these recommendations. There's no... Uh, true long ongoing commitment into funding alternatives other than prisons and you know I'll get more into my lived experience I went into prison in 2005 here in New South Wales into the adult prison and I've yet to see any services start up and be funded to stop our people and mob from going into prison but I can I think on one hand there's been more than about five new prisons established here in New South Wales which to me lets me know that the government has money, just not for our fight, for their fight. I, I also find it very, very hard, you know, within um, our submission, and, and I'll just go across them very, very briefly in our summary, is decriminalising and decarcerating Aboriginal people, uh, police for minor offences, uh, especially public orders, non-violent offences, breaches of justice orders, traffic and minor property offences, uh, raising the age of criminal responsibility, uh, providing a right to bail for our mob when they go into the police station and then into the local court, promoting non-custodial sentences for Aboriginal people who are going through the criminal justice process, culturally responsive and accessible diversionary options for mob that get caught up in the criminal justice space, um, increase long-term and well-resourced early intervention, prevention and diversionary programs especially ones that are operated and controlled by Aboriginal community control organisations, promoting self-determination within Aboriginal people, families and communities across this nation to tackle problems in their own backyard. So that's, I guess, my summary of, of my thoughts on, on, on these um, new recommendations. They clearly miss the mark. And basically what I feel in terms of the recommendations handed down is extensions of what they're already doing. So one of them in here, which I have lived the experience of, is going through the Parkley drug program. And it was not culturally appropriate for me to be an Aboriginal man in that program. I spent 14 months in that centre and I had a NAIDOC day and Uncle Denny Eastwood, who paints for the Koori Mail, would come in and do painting with me once a week. And that's all they had on offer for me. I had to wait until I got to the second stage of that program where I got an ankle monitor and source my own pathway out of that centre to reconnect with my culture, my family and my community. They were there just to make sure that I'm abiding by the centre rules and staying drug free and basically didn't even have a reintegration process for me. Um, I just went to court and got my certificate and they said, congratulations, you passed the program. Just um, obviously hearing your experiences puts a much deeper light on what we're talking about. And it um, also goes back to Alison's acknowledgement that we re really need to take on board people's lived experience. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how important you think it is for um, First Nations voices to be leading these conversations and how we can ensure that more of them are heard. Um, yes, my, I, I feel like I am very well supported and I'm very well 
privilege to be in such a supportive network within my wife, my work, and outside of my work, to be able to take this challenge on, talk about my, my, my childhood trauma, to talk also about my institutional trauma. Um, before me, I didn't have an Aboriginal man that stood up and said, these things affected me and they're going to continue affecting me well on into my adulthood. I was raised by, I was raised on the streets and I was raised by criminals that have already been and spent multiple stints inside adult institutions while I was a juvenile. They were preparing me for adult imprisonment and the teachings that they gave me and the idea of what a man plays in my community was based on these guys. They didn't cry, they never asked for help, and they did whatever was necessary within their means to make sure that they made money to take care of their family. That went on for about 22 years, and I'm still in, still in the process of unlearning all of these lessons that I learned growing up in an over-policed, marginalised Aboriginal community here in the inner city of Sydney. Um, and, and I choose now to stand up and to say, I've been a part of those lessons. I've been a part of those teachings. I've been a part of these institutions. I've taken part in crime. I've taken part in drugs. And now I've removed drugs and crimes from my life. And all of those things affect me mentally every day, trying to stand up and, and, and educate people on my experience. So I hope that I can provide that beacon of hope for those men, women, children that are still trapped in this cycle and feel like there is no way out. I want to be that beacon of hope because for me trying to exit the criminal justice system and give up drugs and crime and try to give work, there was no example for me. Every program, every intervention I went into, I would ask them, what quality of life can I live if I never finish school, I've never had a job, I don't have a tax file number, I'm homeless, I've got no support, what quality of life can I live other than just surviving every day? And they couldn't tell me. So it was up to me when I have the opportunity to go to that program to build my own uh, entry, not re-entry, my entry to the community. I had nothing in this community to fight for. I was homeless. I was a heroin addict by the time I was 15. I lost both of my parents. I was taken from my home. I was taken from my older brothers. I spent time in police cells with my siblings. I spent time in prison with my siblings. I was two out in a cell with my brother and we still haven't healed from our childhood trauma. My two older brothers are still trapped in this cycle and I still have to stand up and be that beacon of hope. I have two children of my own now and I fight every day for a change in this system so my boys don't end up in this and they don't lose their life to this fight. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's so powerful and moving and words that people are privileged but need to hear. In a way, you've started to uh, answer my next question, but it was really about getting you to tell us about Deadly Connections, why you established it, the kind of work that you do that you now understand is the sort of thing that might make a difference and, and what, what you and Carly are hoping to achieve with it. Ah, man, that's a big question. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was started on the back of me trying to leave my, my, my past life behind and not really understanding the pathway for an individual like me who has had that experience. So I had to, you know, um, what do, how do they say? There's a terminology of the first one through the wall is the bloodiest. So I'm the bloodiest. Nobody from my circle has broken through the wall, has lived a better quality of life, and now does not have to worry about running from the police, police kicking my door in, um, worrying about, you know, who's looking out for me? Um, is somebody going to come and fight me in the middle of the street? I had to break that wall. But the, the inception and the, the, the development of Deadly Connections was my wife, who's a very intelligent Aboriginal woman herself, worked in the community sector, worked for justice, worked for corrective services, went and got a master's degree in criminology and worked for these government departments, but couldn't really affect any change internally. I came out of, from my lived experience, I was able to be brave enough and strong enough to stand up and share my story, but at the same time, understand that these kids 
And also the elders that are still trapped in this cycle need to understand there's a better quality of life. It takes hard work and it does take a toll on you, but we need to be strong for the next generation. Um, unfortunately for me, my extensive criminal record kept me out of participating in the work environment that I wanted to do. So I was a youth worker who worked for two years while the Office of the Children Guardian done their investigation on me, whether I could be a youth worker or not. So they let me work for two years. I might get upset because it was a really hard process. So they let me work for two years, get engaged, have a child, have our second child expecting, and then after two years say, you can't be a youth worker no more. So they took it off me. I lost my job. I lost my income. I lost everything that centered me as a human being trying to give back to my people and my community. And I thought, what's the point? I relapsed. I got back on the drugs. I was about two choices away from ending back up in prison and spending the rest of my life in prison. And it was only through the support of my wife and myself and the knowledge that I attained along this journey to say, I need to stop this. I need to get some mental health support. I need to get some drug and alcohol support. That's where I fell into, you know what? These people walk and talk a good game that work in this sector. But if they failed me, who else are they going to fail? They did not support me. And this is the wide organisation that I worked with. I won't name them because you know, there is a place for them in the community, but they failed me. They failed my children. They failed my family. The CEO of that organisation came to the hospital and held my son in her arms. When the decision was handed to that organisation that I could not work with children, it severed ties with me. That for me was one of the hardest things to overcome because how much I gave to that organisation of my lived experience, my personal journey and my fight. So I, it, it took a long while to get over and to be the bigger person in this picture and to always be on point and show my mob and my children how to be courageous and to be brave and to show that we are descendants of true warriors for more than 60,000 years in this land and that's not going to break me. I said something needs to be done for our mob to know that they're going to look up, be looked after. And at the same time, if somebody comes behind me, like me, and wants to work in this sector, I'm going to find a way legally where they can give back to community and not have to worry that they're going to be shunned and ostracised just because they made a choice 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago. Um, and also... My, my, my own personal journey and my own lived experience. So Deadly Connections in terms of what we do is this advocacy, lobbying and truth telling where I share my story. But we also have four grassroots program and we take a life course approach, which means we don't want to leave no one behind. So we want to work with mum, dad, kids, siblings, and we want to advocate and support them through any of the process that they're going through, whether it be a death in custody, whether it be a child who's fell into substance misuse and abuse, whether it's a child in custody, whether they lost a child to care because of my own personal experience. So we work with mums and dads to keep them united together, upskill them, equip them with parenting skills, what society expects from them as a parent, rather than reflecting on their own, parenting from their mum and dad and saying, well, I'm just doing what mum and dad told me and what mum and, how mum and dad raised me. So what's wrong with that? So we're saying, you know, through our Deadly Families Project, you know, this is what the government expects of you. You need to have your house in order. You need to be responsive. Kids need to be in school. There needs to be structure. So we have a project to be able to work with our mums and dads. We have an early intervention and prevention program where we work with children aged 7 to 12 of in-prison parents, of um, siblings in prison, of, you know, mental health issues, to get them to understand their place within that home, that you, you don't have any control over these things, but this is how it's going to affect you when you're an adult. This is how you keep yourself safe. This is how we put a safety plan in place for you and the school to keep you engaged in the school. We have a street smart program where we do a detached youth work program. So we go out onto the streets and just hang with young mob. We give them some food. We play some music. I play some footy on the basketball court with them. I play some basketball. My wife does some women's business and talks to the girls. 
but we are out there present so the police don't harass our young people. Why are you hanging in the park? Well, I live across the road. That's why I'm hanging in the park. I don't understand that. They just see Aboriginal kids congregating in a park and they harass them. Then the fourth project that we got is our Breaking the Cycle project. And that's to work with any mob, women or men, or young people aged from 10 up to 60. We want to be able to provide that integral community support and that unconditional love that you would get from a mum and dad and aunties and uncles and men who are in a position and have the capacity to give you unconditional love. That's where, you know, Deadly Connections was, was founded in, in bringing it back to mob and community where we take care of each other. If you don't have food on the table, I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to make sure there's food on the table for tonight, make sure the kids are fed, and then we'll have a look tomorrow on what's going on in that household. Um, man, I'm, I'm very humbled and privileged to be in this position. From my own experience of being homeless and living on the streets, I'm very humbled to be able to make sure there's food in households for kids, be able to make sure electricity is on for families, especially for my brothers who have died in custody to take care of their mums, their little sisters and their cousins. And I don't big note about the work that I do. I do it because it helps me sleep at night and know that my kids are safe and their kids are safe. It's amazing work, um, an amazing story too. Thank you so much. I think you not only brought a tear to my eye and I'm a tough old thing. I think you made Arnie, I thought I saw Arnie Glendra have a little cry there too. So moved she was. Um, it really is inspirational. And of course it must make such a difference to the people that you're working with when they understand what you've been through and what you've been able to achieve. It must be a whole other layer in terms of what they're getting from connecting with you and the work that you're doing and that Carly's doing with you. You work a lot with young people and we, we, heard, the, we heard the little ones in the background there. Um, what's your hope for the next generation? My hope for the next next generation is to empower them with the right tools and skills to continue our fight against the colony, to be self-determined, to be able to, you know, uh, look after our communities the way we know we need to look after them, to be able to look after the troubled people in our communities the way we know how to look after those troubled people, you know, what, what the wider sort of uh, population needs to understand me is before the colony came we were thriving for over 60,000 to 80,000 years within our many different dialects and tribes and codes there is not one word for jail and we all looked after each other and we all made sure that our children were safe and our communities were safe we have the knowledge and the power to be able to govern rule and take care of our own well off communities, but also our most vulnerable members in our communities, women, children, elders, and young people. For me, um, I also want to sort of like reflect a little bit on what Alison talked about in terms of like, uh, you know, justice and the way and, uh, and abolition. So one of the most recent things I learned about in terms of justice is the difference between reform restorative justice and reformative justice. So restorative justice is to get somebody to understand the effect of their crime, where reformative justice is to understand why that person committed a crime and how we can stop that person further committing a crime. So for me, it's around tailoring individual support for people, no matter who they are and where they're from, and to know that this is a long, long battle and a long fight. And uh, invest in Aboriginal community control organisations. We know who the troublemakers are in our community, but we also know the people to reach those troublemakers in our community. Police aren't doing that. It's been, you know, 30 years and no justice. And it's been 17 years since my mate was chased in Redfern by police impaled on a fence and pulled off that fence and died in the hospital whilst being surrounded by the police. And his mother now has to live with that with no justice, no explanation, no apology, no way of 
telling her grandkids and her daughters of of like what happened to TJ Hickey. You know, so I have the privilege of 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 being very close to Annie Gale and have permission to always talk about him wherever I can and however I can. And within that coronial inquest, and it's very public, the documents, you know, the police officer um, took the stand and said he won't testify because he will incriminate himself. And the the coroner uh, at that time basically patted him on the back and said, good work, don't do that. I advise you not to do that. It's something that's torn my community apart. That's affected me really, really bad because when I found out that TJ was killed, I was in Cobham Juvenile Justice Centre and I went and got locked into my cell after a phone call of telling me that my friend just got killed by police. I'm still now healing from those wounds and my community is still healing, not just from TJ, but from Patrick Fisher and Eric Whitaker. These are three boys that I've grown up with, that I slept with, that I slept head to toe with, that I run the streets with, and their family has no justice and no recourse of ever getting justice for the death of their loved one. Mm. Just, I think everyone listening is going to be very moved by what you're saying. And I guess what I would say to them is... um, translate that uh, emotion and those feelings into action. And I was wondering from your perspective, particularly for non-Indigenous people listening, how can they help? How can they be part of the solution to stopping over-representation, incarceration, deaths in custody? That's another big question, but I think... <laughs> I asked the big question, Keenan. <laughs> <laughs> Academics. I know. <laughs> um, I think... I think uh, firstly, I'd like to say, as an Aboriginal man, I'm 33, and I'm on a never-ending process of learning about my Aboriginality, learning about my culture, learning about my place within my community and my family and my responsibilities. So to always continue their education on working with mob, how to elevate their voices, never speaking for us, and never doing for us what we can't do for ourselves, but to also follow, I guess, the sort of uh, protocols in terms of affecting change, calling your local member, jumping on board um, campaigns and lobbying and, you know, being an activist, uh, educating people within your own circle, challenging uh, racist stereotypes about Aboriginal people. You know, where did you learn that? How did you learn that? Do you know an Aboriginal person? Did you grow up with one? You know, um, and following us on our socials, we try, I guess, on our Instagram, which has the most traction, to not only um, slap people in the face with information, but also to be lighthearted in a way we give it so it's digestible for them to repost and share and, and basically challenge the narrative around our people. If we only make up 3% of this population, 97% of that population has it very wrong on how we operate, how we work, how we love, how we nurture, and how kind and forgiving our culture is, and how much knowledge we have, how much wisdom we have, how much courage we have, how much strength we have have as Aboriginal people. And when it's time to come together, we all stand together. Um, I'm going to add one thing to that because uh, people can also donate to Deadly Connections, I think, and support the work that you're doing. Um, they can also support Carly's work at the uh, ALS. But, you know, I think importantly, people can help make a difference by doing that. I'm mindful of the time and I just, I know that Arnie Glendra will want to say something. So I'm just going to say, say, see if you you wanted to jump in, Auntie Glendra, after what you'd heard from Keenan, if you had any comments before I wrap up tonight. I think you're still on mute, Auntie. Hi. Oh, am I on? Isn't it wonderful to have my dear friend of 40 years here operating this so I can actually look like I know what I'm doing? Yeah, and thank you. And she's my eyes now because I can't even see very well anymore. So I'm just a train wreck. So, Keenan, I just want to say you said it much better than me, but the pathway from not being with your family, not having that support, not having that unconditional love, 
you know, go, going through all those different phases and then juvenile justice and, you know, the big house, as I call it, oh, it's just like hundreds and hundreds of our, of our people's stories. It's not even a story, it's an account of their life. It's about how do we make this better? We can't, you know, like the bringing them home recommendations haven't been implemented, you know, like we haven't healed from our transgenerational trauma. And, you know, I was just a, um, the other day I was with a family that were a black deaths in custody in, in the a coroner's at the moment. And I was a um, cultural expert and I said to the, um, the Crown solicitor when she rang me, I'm, I'm no expert and I said, no, I won't say anything unless the family want me to. But what became aware to me was that there was no support around that family because it's so painful and so raw that people just move away instead of putting their arms around and, and supporting the, the people. And, you know, like the first time meeting her, and her brother, you know, it's a large family. There, there should have, what well, I believe, a lot of people there. And, you know, it was just this one one old, old lady, you know, she's not real old, not like me, but, you know, older, older, there for her dad. And, you know, and I mean, I don't think the coroner's here from real, real people because I made her cry. I made her cry talking about how, how we should, no one should die alone not in any culture. You know, we all want to, you know, want to have someone to hold our hands and, and love us. No one should die in a cold, cold um, cell on their own. And she said to me, oh, there'll be change as well. I told her I'd get back to her if there wasn't. Well, you put her on notice, auntie. <laughs> yeah, you know, don't want to, don't want to see crocodile tears. I want to see action, you know, like, like Keenan said, us old ones, we've been fighting this battle for a long time. I didn't realise it was 40 years until the old Kinchula boy said, oh, auntie, you've been um, fighting for us for 40 years when no one wanted to, to know about us. And I thought, geez, I was young then. And I was. But, you know, like the, the, the founders of Link Up, like, the, am I allowed to say Larissa? Yes, you can say my dad. Her dad. <laughs> You know, Peter Reed, um, Umra Edwards, you know, they were our heroes from the beginning. And like Car Carly said, you know, the ones that fought for the ALS, you know, the Aboriginal Medical Service, you know, they're, they're our heroes. They're the, we, can, we can be those heroes. Not, you know, you're, you're already that hero, Keenan. You're already that person. You know, the... the the number of people you have touched today mm -hmm. by your truth telling, your raw truth telling, saying, look, I wasn't perfect. The cheese fell off me cracker once or twice, when, even when I should have known better. But that's the truth telling that will change people's lives. That will, people go, yeah, that, he did it. I can do it. And, you know, you're, you've got pretty much the perfect family now. That woman of yours was blogging things and bringing in your in things. And I thought, geez, like everyone's going to want her. You want to watch her, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be going, hey, I want one of them. <laughs> so, yeah, so proud of you, proud of you. Keep up the good work. And like I said, you know, um, you're being noticed. People are noticing the good work you've do you're doing. And you'll, you'll continue to make good decisions. Otherwise, I'm going to have to track you down. Hey. <laughs> Don't want that, Keenan. No. <laughs> so much, Tiny Glendra. That's, that's, uh, there were some lovely words. And um, I think what we've, we've heard this evening is actually from, from um, three people who are well on the way to being heroes with the work that they do. I think it's really important to take a moment to acknowledge that. Um, the, we've got wonderful expertise on the panel, but what sits behind that is actually very long hours, yeah. uh, tireless work. I, I know both Carly and Alison really well, and I, I know Keenan by reputation. These are people who never 
say no to anyone, always yeah. help, always do what they want, go the extra mile. We're really lucky to have all three of you in the community doing the work that you do. Um, we're lucky to have you, Arnie Glendra, keeping us all honest and chasing us down and go off the rails. Or oh, what was that great face? If our cheese falls off our crackers. <laughs> That's my takeaway from tonight. I've got the so saying I'm for everything. I've got the <laughs> saying for everything. My saying at the moment is, and Kenyon, you can listen to this, you can take this on, health is wealth. Because if we've, we've got our health, we're very wealthy, you know. And um, I'm grateful totally grateful to the Aboriginal Medical Service that I'm still here today. So um just wanted to plug for them because you know you know and Dr. Ruth is a bull terrier. <laughs> well, we've done a good we've gonna done a good plug for the importance of our community controlled organisation. That's exactly right. Exactly. Everyone's got that takeaway. And I think if we were in the old traditional forum of a of panelists on stage there would be rousing applause right now from our our um audience yes. in uh, appreciation of everything you've shared with us tonight and so i just, I like just, like to I just say something to carly the other day i was on a, a symposium with um a few people and you had a, one of your lawyers there and and um the magistrate said oh well uh, am i allowed to say her name well, Gemma. anyway g get you know apologize after i've said the wrong thing she said, oh, I don't think she'll be here. Um, she's got 50 matters. Now, fair dinkum, you know, how can you as a service run like that? It's just incredible. If we're talking about hard work, let's give a big shout out to the Aboriginal Legal Service, eh? Keep up the good work, girl. And, yep. you know, stay strong and look after yourself because that's Thanks. incredible. Thanks, Aunt, and thank you for the shout out um, to the team because they work absolutely yeah. tirelessly day in and day out um, yeah. to provide high quality, culturally safe legal help and just so proud of them. Yeah. A great yeah. shout out. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge George Newhouse and Timothy Ginty and the National Justice Project who were obviously important uh, supporters tonight along with um, the New South Wales ACT ALS and Deadly Connections. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending, listening, opening your minds and your hearts, everyone who submitted a question, and finally to thank our amazing panellists this evening, not just for sharing your time and insights with us tonight, but for all the important work you do. Arnie Glendra Stubbs, Carly Warner, Alison Whitaker, and Keenan Mundine. Thank you, everyone. Take care and good night. Good night.